Good evening. Or if you're on the West Coast, good afternoon. I am Michael Dodd, chair of the Austin Lawyer Chapter of the American Constitution Society. On behalf of our Austin chapter, as well as the ACSs at large, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Los Angeles, Michigan, New York, Oregon, Sacramento, San Diego, St. Louis, and Washington DC lawyer chapters, as well as the Austin Bar Association, the Houston Bar Association, the Asian American Bar Association of Houston, along with StopRepeatingHistory.org. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome you to our program. A republic, if you can keep it our professional responsibility to safeguard the rule of law. The January 6th attack on our nation's capital forcefully, indeed, and unfortunately, violently demonstrated that Benjamin Franklin's legendary reply to a woman's question after the 1787 convention, constitutional convention, what have we got, a republic, or a monarchy was no flippant witticism. Hamilton and Madison would warn in their writings championing ratification of the Constitution that past republics had ended in turbulence and tyranny. Franklin was being deadly serious. The delegates had given the American people a republic if they, if we indeed can keep it. Before going further, a bit of housekeeping. The American Constitution Society is a 501c3 organization. As such, ACS does not support political candidates or political parties. We ask everyone involved this evening, panelists, participants, to be mindful of and respect that. We're pleased that the state bars of California and Texas have approved our program for continuing legal education credit. Please go to the chat bar for information about how to access that information and for the course number for Texas. Our program would not be possible without the help of numerous organizations and people. These include the American Constitution Society's Peggy Lee and Princess Jefferson, the Ving Groups Vincent Ng and Joyce Liu, StopRepeatingHistory.org's Don Tamaki, Coonhart Film Foundation's Emily Keating, Coonhart being the producer of the filmmaker, and of course, HBO for licensing the use of the documentary, The Soul of America, about Don Meacham's book by the same name. HBO has licensed it to us for free during this time and if you have not seen it yet, you still have time to view it through Saturday. Our program has several clips from the documentary. These will be interspersed throughout the presentation. We also have a pre-recorded clip from the Honorable Colin Allred, representative of the 32nd Congressional District of Texas. He was an eyewitness to the January 6th assault on our Capitol, and it will be shown just before our fourth and last panelist. Our panelists include Angela Anwachi Willig, the Dean, as well as Professor of Law at the Boston University School of Law, Don Tamaki, partner with Manami Tamaki LLP. He was a former attorney for Fred Karamatsu, and he was interviewed in the film. And we're very happy to have him with us live as well. Next, Stephen Vladek, the Charles Allen Wright Chair in Federal Courts at the University of Texas School of Law here in Austin. Steve is also on the ACS's Board of Academic Advisors. And Nadine, I'm sorry, Nadine Strassen, John Marshall Harlan II Professor of Law Emerita at New York Law School. Nadine is also a former president of the American Civil Liberties Union. Our panel will be moderated by Heaven Chi, 
Evan is an attorney with Yetter Coleman in Houston. Prior to beginning her private practice of law, Evan clerked for the Honorable George C. Hanks Jr. of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Texas. After the panel discussion, Manuel Quinto Pozos, past chair of the Austin Lawyer Chapter, will close our program. We turn now to our first clip from the documentary, which we have titled Perennial American Forces. It provides an historic backdrop to our discussion, after which Heaven will lead us into the panel discussion. Nativism, xenophobia, racism, sexism, isolationism are perennial American forces. They ebb and they flow. The story of race and fear and anxiety and violence is inextricably intertwined with the story of the country. It's not that the soul of a country has been captured by a particular group at a particular time. The soul of the country is, in fact, this essence, which is not all good or all bad. You have your better angels fighting against your worst impulses. And that has a religious component, certainly. It's also, though, a matter of historical observation. Our history is shaped by the extent to which those better angels or those worst instincts went out in a given period of time. It was true in the 1760s. It was true in the 1860s. It was true in the 1960s. And it's true today. You will not replace us! You will not replace us! One people, one nation, and immigration! A white nationalist blogger had called upon his followers to meet here in Charlottesville to protest the city's efforts to try to take down a statue of Robert E. Lee from a city park. When the Charlottesville riots happened, the neo-Nazi rally and then the death of Heather Heyer, the editor of Time Magazine at the time called and said, do you have anything to say historically about the history of hate in American politics? So I started with Reconstruction and moved forward. And it became a book about the soul of the country. The fact that in the 21st century, people calling themselves Klansmen are in Charlottesville, Virginia, the home of Robert E. Lee, basically fighting for an antebellum vision of the world is a remarkable thing. But it's not all that remarkable if you know American history. And if you know, that five minutes after Lee's surrender, the reaction sets in. White supremacy replaced slavery as the consuming concern of white Southerners. Segregation replaced human enslavement. And so when people say the Civil War never really ended, that's pretty much what they mean. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us, Dean Anwachi Willig, or Angela, if you don't mind my, my calling you that. It is of an course. honor to have this opportunity to hear from you this, this, this evening. And I just wanted to, to kind of jump right in on John Meacham's very first line that, clip that we saw. And he talks about these perennial forces that he, call, that he identifies as xenophobia, racism, sexism, and various other isms of the like that, that are at the heart of discrimination. And he, we just saw several examples just ranging for the past several hundred years, the KKK all the way to Charlottesville in the past four years. So I wanted to ask you, what is it about these, these isms that make them recurring threats to democracy? And what is it about them that, that is tied together that seems to be that we cannot get rid of them in the whole course of American history to date? Yeah, I mean, I would say the things that tie them together, the common glues are really white supremacy and, and the narratives that have been told to ensure and maintain the subordination and the oppression of people of color. Um, and in particular, narratives uh, concerning what people view as 
the biological nature of race and, and what they believe that means in terms of the either natural or inherent inferior, inferiority of people of color to white people. Um, so, um, it, you know, Brian Stevenson, he's a, a, you know, the author of Just Mercy, a renowned civil rights attorney. He once said, and basically essentially the same thing that was said in the film, he says, the primary evil of slavery, it wasn't involuntary servitude. It wasn't forced labor. It wasn't the brutal, the brutal violence that slave owners essentially heaped on enslaved blacks during slavery. Um, that the real evil of slavery was the narrative that was created to justify the horrendous treatment of enslaved black people in this country. And that narrative uh, was that black people were not fully human, that black people were three fifths of a person. Um, and it was, or it is, or I would say a narrative that marks people of color as other. It's a narrative that defines race as real and that it then attaches consequential social meaning to race based on morphological differences. So Stevens, Stevenson points out that the great harm is that it's um, this narrative of racial difference has persisted. Um, in fact, he says that it's that the, the North may have won the Civil War, but it was the South that won the narrative war. Uh, and if we look at these racialized narratives, which are so deeply rooted in white supremacy, they've been employed to justify the mistreatment and subordination of all people of color. So for example, consider narratives, uh, these narratives include myths about the savagery and the primitive nature of Native Americans, myths that were told to justify the slaughter, the, the, the essential genocide of, of American Indians. These narratives include stories of Japanese Americans as perpetual foreigners and as sneaky and disloyal spies, all of which were articulated to justify the internment of US citizens of Japanese descent. Um, these narratives include stereotypes of Latinx individuals as leeches seeking to sponge off the US welfare system and as criminals or as um, uh, our former president once said as rapists and all again used to justify the separation of parents from children in Latinx families that were seeking a new life in the United States uh, and to explain away the detention of migrants from Mexico and South America and Central America um, uh, in cages, you know, what many people have described as the internment of Latinx migrants. Um, and, and these narratives have changed um, just as the laws have changed and they try to tell a different story about inclusion, but because we have not truly grappled with race and racism in this country, um, both individualized, structural, we see that racism, that the subordination of people of color persist, right? The, the white supremacy underlying these narratives persist. The racism underlying these narratives persist, right? Um, um, and Derek Bell, who's a, 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 the late Derek Bell, who's a, a noted scholar in law, you know, once um, explained that the forms of racism really only adapt, racism only adapts it or evolves over time. And it's, sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's not so subtle. So for example, the racist enslavement of black people evolved into a different, still subordinating and racist system of sharecropping, price gouging, black codes and a reign of terror through lynches, lynchings and other forms of violence that work to essentially maintain the enslavement of blacks. That system of racism then morphed into a Jim Crow system that sustained the same inequities um, and that was upheld through the same type of violence. The Jim Crow system of racism transformed into a post-civil rights era of colorblind racism, both structural and individual, that doesn't challenge the structures and the thinking that both maintain and deepen racial inequality and disadvantage. Um, and this post-civil rights era form of racism reifies the inequities and disadvantages in ways that have resulted in mass incarceration, in ways that widen rather than contract racial wealth disparities, uh, that result in massive inequity and in unemployment and types of employment. And we saw that in the overwhelming and devastating impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. Um, and I would say lastly, that an important part of, of these narratives of racial difference is what motivates it all. And that's you know, meaning white skin privilege and more accurately, the social meaning that whiteness has for white people in the United States, what Shore Harris calls whiteness as property. Um, and, and when I say whiteness as property, I mean not only the material benefits of whiteness, not only access to um, better jobs, access to higher wages, access to better education, um, things of that nature, intergenerational transfers of wealth, it's about what W.B. Du Bois called the psychological wages of whiteness, right? The idea or the assurance 
um, particularly for poor and working class white laborers, that they would never be at the bottom of social, social hierarchy so long as blacks and other people of color remain there. Um, and this desire to maintain white privilege, both material and psychic, and to ensure the subordination of people of color is precisely what prevented Southern white working class uh, uh, laborers from forming coalitions with formerly enslaved blacks during reconstruction. Um, it remains the reason why so many poor and working class whites continue to vote against their economic interests. Why people who so desperately needed access to affordable health, health care were willing to vote for people who wanted to completely tear down the Affordable Care Act or otherwise known as o Obamacare. Um, and the narratives that told then have essentially remained the same um, as those told in the past. Uh, so for example, we tell the same narratives of, for, as black people as inferior, as lazy, as too irresponsible to be productive workers and contributors to society. And, and that means that we can't give people freedom, we can't give people political power because it will ruin the nation. And that's how we found ourselves watching an insurrection um, at our nation's capital on January 6th. And so the psychic wage of whiteness doesn't pay the bills, doesn't pay rent, doesn't pay food, doesn't pay for clothing, but it feeds a sense of superiority and a sense of entitlement that is just too intoxicating for some people to walk away from. Yet yeah, listening to you and the terminology you're using is really helping crystallize the concepts because I, you know, I, I hear a lot about narratives, the myth, the morphing, the evolution of the underlying causes here. And I, you've studied this your whole career and you're an expert in this, but you know, there are landmark, uh, both legislation and landmark Supreme Court cases that the most lawyers and most society really considers as like huge points of progress in American society, like the Civil Rights Act, yeah, Brown versus Board, uh, but as lawyers and especially as um, especially judges tend to be really constricted in what they can do um, in shaping the law or shaping opinion. And so I wanted to ask you, like, what are the tools that work effectively or did not work effectively in these previously thought of as huge victories for civil rights? Um, because when you're dealing with a narrative or a myth, how do you, how how do we confront that as lawyers who have a narrow tool for address, for example, in Brown versus Board of Education, just education? Um, and can you talk about that? Like what, what happened in the past and what we could do in the future? Yeah, so, so I talk about, I mean, part of the story is, is it, the, the main thing is I say what makes it ineffective or, or effective is whether you're telling the full story, right? And so what happens in Brown, which is, you know, of course, a decision that has changed um, you know, I, I won't deny the impact of Brown. Brown it helped to change uh, my life. It helped to change the lives of so many people. But what made um, what made Brown effective, of course, is that it appealed to the better angels of us, as as um, as Meacham would say, right? It's, it functions as a symbol of progress. Um, but what makes it ineffective is how it was shaped and how it was told in order for it to appeal to the better angels of all of us. Um, and what that meant is that there were critical parts of the narrative that were left out in Brown um, that should have been told, that should have been included, that should have been recognized, um, that should have been incorporated in legal doctrine, right, in order for us to actually be closer to achieving full equality. So, you know, Brown tells us that separate but, separate but equal is inherently unequal. It reminds us, importantly, that education is the foundation of citizenship. Um, it tells us that segregation generates a feeling in the inferiority uh, of, of inferiority in, in black children uh, um, in, a, in their hearts and minds in a way that is as unlikely to ever be undone. Uh, but Brown, unlike Loving versus Virginia, fails to name precisely what is responsible for these harms, which is white supremacy. Um, it never acknowledges white supremacy, that white supremacy perpetuates racial injustice that our society continues to experience today. So um, in, a, in a critique of, of, in some ways of Brown, Randall Kennedy has highlighted the court fails to even discuss the purposes of segregation. What was, the, what was segregation trying to achieve? Um, it failed to name the perpetrators of segregation who was causing these harms. And those kinds of moves, those kinds of silences have led to a narrative of innocence, right, in our country that really pushes us away from really grappling with the real problems of racism. They're precisely the narratives that enable whites who have engaged in racist conduct to focus on intent and not on consequence. Um, and the fact of the matter is that whether you're stepping on my neck intentionally or unintentionally, um, the, the, the harm still occurs and the, the impact is still the same. Um, and we see these kinds of storytelling tools being used in all kinds of ways. So for example, we'll see them in 
police reports, right, which which tend to be written in, in more of a um, a passive a passive voice, right, All right, that sort of front loads or puts the the um, the 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 subject or the person who some of us might call the victim at the forefront and puts the actors right, makes them invisible, makes renders them in, invisible. Um, the pre pre uh, era, pre reconstruction era amendments have been read in this same manner, um, requiring intent before there can be proof of discrimination. And if you look, I mean, essentially, if you ask me, if you look at all of anti-discrimination law, it reads more like an attempt to find any excuse but um, discrimination um, as, the, as the reason why a particular, uh, conduct, uh, a particular uh, consequence occurred. The other thing that Brown never does is it, it never considers the harm of segregation. Um, the harm that segregation causes to whites, right? So it says if segregation generates an inf a feeling of inferi inferiority in the hearts and minds of black children, but what does it do for white children? It generates a feeling of superiority in the hearts and minds of white children. And one that is ever unlikely to be undone as we have seen over and over in our society. And this silence in Brown leaves us or left us with this feeling that there was nothing, there was only um, one side in which things had to be corrected, that all that needed to, to, to be done in order to correct for past injustice was to grant formal access for people of color to what white people had long had real access to. Um, and um, <clears throat> there's no way that we can really ever really address um, racism without naming white supremacy, um, without talking about not only the people who are um, the being subordinated, but those who are the drivers of the subordination, and and it, and it can even be a white supremacy, white privilege, right? And the actors who are engaging in that conduct, um, uh, it it never commun it, it sent, left us with the sense that we could. Um, that we could, you know, have our cake and eat it too. That that um, we could remedy discrimination without saying it doesn't ever communicate to whites. And what it means to be in a more equal society means that in a world in which white people had access to greater things simply because they were white and people of color had less access simply because they were people of color, that that means that um, some people that people have to lose their privilege, right? And so, uh, what we need to do is we really need to tell the full story. Really, we need to tell the honest story in order for us to have real change. Absolutely, and thank you so much, Angela. And I, oh, I would recommend that all of us. Uh, I think we got a little bit of feedback. Uh, I would recommend that everyone who has a chance just read. I'll just have to give a shout out to um, my the, the UVA's law review pro, uh, published uh, Dean Onwachi's long article about uh, Brown versus Board, and I think some everyone who went to law school studies Brown versus Board, but not the whole story that she was just telling us about. So I'd absolutely recommend that. That should be a central reading to everyone, all the lawyers on the line. So thank you so much for your thank remarks. You. And with that, it, um, I'd like to, to move on to the John Meacham, Mount John Meacham's clip about the civil rights movement. A hundred years from the end of the civil war through the civil rights movement is a vivid case study in the struggle between our worst instincts and our better angels. In the civil rights legislation of 64 and 65, our better angels won. In a ferocious struggle with our worst instincts. And if we want a model for how to move ahead, looking at those years is instructive. sixties, we felt the stain of segregation and racial discrimination. And when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to do something. We cannot continue to accept these conditions of oppression, for this is not a struggle for ourselves alone. It is a struggle to save the soul of America. When I participated in the movement, I was 15. It would not have been successful had it not been for ordinary little nobodies doing their part to make it happen. By 1963, the full panoply of segregation was under attack. It begins to culminate on the streets of Alabama. The campaign was directed against racial discrimination in Birmingham, the most totally segregated big city in the South. I had a made-up mind that I could handle whatever was coming. 
and be nonviolent. In May, thousands of children march against segregation in Birmingham. The city is determined to maintain order. They're attacked by fire hoses, by police dogs. To see children treated like this, the whole nation rose up in arms. The events in Birmingham have sent a chill through most Americans. What the movement did is dramatize the stakes between good and evil. I will be present to bar the entrance of any Negro who attempts to enroll at the University of Alabama. All of these incidents have a slow cascading effect on the opinion of the country. I have a dream to be. And honestly, the opinion of President Kennedy. Good evening, Professor Vladek. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I wanted to dive right in because what we just saw was um, John Meacham declaring victory over um, the forces that Dean Onwachi was just talking about. He said, our better angels prevailed in the century after the, the Civil War. Um, and I think he probably thought that, I, I, it sounds like he thinks that because our institutions survived. And so I wanted to ask you about this very unique system of both government and also the way our legal system is structured in the judiciary and how those just institutions impacted progress for better or for worse. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that it, it, it worked in both directions. I mean, I think the, you know, the notion that there's a nice straight line from the end of the Civil War, you know, through to the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 60s is really belied by the real history of Reconstruction. I mean, the, you know, the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s is really the second Civil Rights Movement in American history. There was a profound and sustained civil rights movement after the Civil War, we just call it Reconstruction, um, right? The first Civil Rights Act um, is actually the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Um, Congress passes additional civil rights laws in 1870, 1871, and 1875. Um, and indeed, we actually see, you know, during Reconstruction, the most aggressive uses of federal power um, against states in all of American history, even more aggressive than we saw during much of the Civil War itself when President Grant um, repeatedly sends military troops um, into the South, not just to put down an insurrection like the Civil War, but to actually administer local and state governments. Um, and you know that was at the time perceived to be, and I think correctly necessary to put teeth into those new civil rights laws, but it also provoked profound resentment, um, not just from you know, unreconstructed Southerners, but also from Northern elites um, who had been, you know, even ones who had been fervently abolitionist, um, who just thought that there was not a good enough justification for continuing to devote all of this capital, financial and otherwise, into this program. So, you know, part of the story here is sort of the, you know, one step forward, one and a half steps backward problem that we see, um, where you have the federal government take this remarkably aggressive role after the Civil War, um, but then all that starts to fall apart in the Compromise of 1877, when the Republicans agree to end Reconstruction in exchange for Hayes being declared the winner of the disputed election. And then we see, you know, having the Supreme Court, um, including, a, you know, a number of Republican justices, um, at least progressives of that era, you know, really adopting incredibly stilted readings of some of those new constitutional provisions of some of these landmark civil rights laws that effectively denuded them um, in the slaughterhouse cases in 1873 and the civil rights cases in 1883, you know, most famously, and I think infamously in Plessy um, in 1896. And so I think, you know, the federal government is such an important part of the story because it's not just Congress. Um, and indeed, when we finally get to the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, Congress doesn't go first. Um, the courts do. Um, right. And so it's the you know, it's not just the Supreme Court decision in Brown. It's all of the um, equalization cases the NAACP brings leading up to that. The Supreme Court goes first. Congress goes second. But heaven, it's only when all of the federal government is acting in concert that we actually see real progress on this front. And I think one of the things that's been frustrating about the, the last 30, 40 years is that we haven't seen that concerted effort across the federal government because we've increasingly seen courts that have been hostile to some aspects of this program, look no further than voting rights in Shelby County. Yeah, I mean, that, that in itself is a uniquely American thing, like lifetime appointed judges who are independent, nonpartisan, not associated with any party, especially the party in power or not in power, 
that is something that we really pride ourselves as Americans on. And that what were the federal courts doing that either necessitated the legislation and then repeated legislation being passed, or what were they doing to give teeth or not give teeth to these these civil rights laws in the the century after the Civil War? Yeah, I mean, you know, I I, I think that the only real period where the federal courts are leading the way as opposed to sort of either following or acting as the brakes um, really is, you know, the Warren Court era. I mean, I think that's that's the only era where we really see the federal courts actually take this aggressive view that it's part of their job to be, you know, sort of helping us at the stage. Um, and so, you know, I, I completely agree with Angela that there's there's plenty of, of holes to pick um, and and bones to pick with some of what the with some of the decisions with you know what Brown doesn't say, um, right? But you know, it's it's the it's the federal courts between 19 really 38. Um, when you have the first equalization case gains um, and the early 1970s um, that, are cl- that are giving space legally for Congress to pass ever more aggressive legislation. I mean, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, right? One of the most aggressive pieces of civil rights legislation Congress has ever enacted. And I think part of what really starts to arrest that movement is not just that some of the political capital dissipates in the political branches, is that the courts start pushing back um, and the courts start actually, you know, really standing up to some of these efforts. I mean, the first, um, d- the first Supreme Court decision resisting a desegregation decree, right, is 1974. Um, so that's really the beginning of the end to me. And I think the lesson is that, you know, civil rights is this ongoing project that is only going to be best achieved when you really have all three branches of the federal government swimming in the same direction. And we really haven't had that many periods of American history where that's been true. Yeah, that is, I mean, that was what I wanted to ask you is like, is it better or worse that when there's progress in civil rights that it comes to the legislature? Like, does it give it more legitimacy or is it better when the Supreme Court takes a role? I mean, it's a debate that I think is especially heightened now as the judiciary changes shape. Um, And I think a lot, I've heard just commentary from other civil rights lawyers that say like, we can't move the needle unless we move the needle in the electorate and the the legislature. uh, What are your thoughts on going forward, what what we should do or or how we could advance civil rights and enshrine democracy? I mean, I think the bottom line is everything matters um, and and that we can't just sort of give up on one branch um, and, and put all of our eggs into another basket. That, you know, the only way to actually have meaningful, effective, reform in this space is to be pushing both the political actors and the at least outwardly apolitical actors on the imperative for reform, on why, you know, we need voting rights reform and why the Supreme Court needs to let Congress pursue voting rights reform. Um, And, you know, I think that's why it is so, I think, sort of frustrating from where I sit, right, to see um, how much better historically the, you know, those who we tend to think of as opponents of civil rights have been at prioritizing courts um, than the advocates have been. And where, you know, yes, we need legislatures to be aggressive at both the state and federal level, um, but we also need courts that are going to understand the imperative for these, these movements. And I think the, you know, we, we, can, we can only strive for some of this. We can't necessarily accomplish it, but that has to be the aspiration if we actually, you know, want to try to accomplish structural change. And I'll just ask you a quick a last last question, and it may be that there is no good answer to this, but given that we do have this uniquely American system where the, the judiciary that we have is, is what it is, and they will be on the bench for life, um, is there anything as lawyers in private practice or in academia that we can do to get that judiciary who really understands that all three bodies of government need to be firing on the same firing on the same wavelength in order for us to make progress in the, the fight for racial equality or voting rights or um, yeah, I mean, gender equality. I, I, mean, I, think, I think some of that work has to come through the work we're doing um, mm-hmm. and helping to educate the those who actually are willing to be educated. Um, of course, there are going to be those who aren't willing to be educated whose minds are made up. And I think then the question is just figuring out ways of minimizing the impact and the effect they can have. And so, you know, one of the, when we talk about courts, I mean, I think everyone's so focused on who the judges are. I think that we don't spend enough time talking about all of the ways in which the political branches can affect how the courts do their jobs. I mean, Congress has historically exercised a heck of a lot more control over federal courts than it does today. 
Um, and so trying to suggest that like it's appropriate and indeed necessary for Congress to reclaim some of that control, I think is part of the story that we all need to be telling. That's fascinating. Well, th thank you so much for your comments. And I wanted to uh, I turn now to the next clip, which is uh, going to show us about um, Japanese internment and the, the failure of the Supreme Court in Korematsu. By February 1942, President Roosevelt signs Executive Order 9066. And this empowered the military to take control of the eight most Western states. General DeWitt is placed in command of that whole Western region. General DeWitt uh, said that Japanese Americans are an enemy race. He said very emphatically, a Jap's a Jap. A scrap of paper attesting to his citizenship doesn't alter that fact. He began issuing public proclamations singling out Japanese Americans. A curfew came down. Japanese Americans had to be home by 8 o'clock and stay home until 6 a.m. in the morning. The government froze our bank account. Rents couldn't be paid. My father's dry cleaning business fell apart. Everything was lost. Everything. And then the soldiers came. One morning, my parents got me up very early, together with my brother and my baby sister, and dressed us uh, hurriedly. And suddenly, we saw two soldiers marching up our driveway, carrying rifles with shiny bayonets. And they stomped at the front porch and with their fists began pounding on the door. Uh, that sound is still resonates in my mind. My father came out, answered the door, and we were ordered out of our home. We stood on the driveway waiting for our mother to come out. And when she came out, she had our baby sister in one arm, a huge, heavy-looking duffel bag in the other, and tears were streaming down her cheeks. We were taken by truck to uh, the uh, Buddhist temple in downtown Los Angeles in Little Tokyo. And that's where we were all assembled. The heads of the families were ordered to report, and we were given our family number and tag. buses took us to Santa Anita, where we were unloaded and herded over to the stable areas. And each family was assigned a horse stall to sleep in. Still pungent with the stink of horse manure. We were there about three or four months Then we were loaded onto trains with armed soldiers at both ends of each car. We were transported two thirds of the way across the country to the swamps of Arkansas. There were 10 camps all together. Roar, Arkansas was the farthest east. The camps were not camps, they were prisons. They lived in dusty barracks. There were cracks in the walls, so they had to stuff newspaper in to stop the wind from blowing in. They had common latrines without doors. The food was terrible, inadequate medical care. I did go to school.
And I remember we began every school day with a pledge of allegiance to the flag. I could see the barbed wire fence and the sentry tower right outside my schoolhouse window as I recited the words, with liberty and justice for all. By the end of 1942, you had almost 120,000 Americans, people like my mother and my father who were born in California or citizens by birth, who had lost their property, they had lost their freedom, some had even lost their lives without any trial, without any charges, and for no offense. We were incarcerated for the duration of the war, four years. When we were freed, we had nothing. For my parents, everything that they had worked for was taken away. Good evening, Don. Thank you so much for joining. I know that we, we just heard from you narrating the, the clip in the documentary, but I just wanted to, to keep copying this that such helpful phrase that Dean Onwachi kept using, which is the narrative. Because um, we, we picked up on, in the film, a lot of the, the wrongs that happened to Japanese Americans in terms of the effect it had on them. But I wanted to go back a little bit and, and talk about the narrative that the federal government was telling in order to, round up all of the Japanese Americans and put them in the camps. And also what was the real narrative? Because I think finally we, are, we saw a snapshot of what the real narrative was when the Supreme Court reversed itself first when you and your colleagues got Fred Korematsu's criminal conviction reversed, but then again in Trump versus Hawaii. So um, can you talk about what, what really happened in, in terms of what the government's narrative was, what the real narrative was, and also what happened to um, our system of government and civil rights for marginalized communities when that narrative um, is pushed forward by the government? Well, I'm with John Meacham on one point and that is we can learn a lot from, from history. So Korematsu is now general, generally regarded as among the worst decisions the court ever rendered. It's right up there with Plessy and Dred Scott. What most people don't know, however, is that Korematsu is also the result of a scandal of epic proportions. Uh, to Professor Onwachi's, uh, Willick's point, uh, white supremacy is deeply embedded uh, as societal norms in, in our country. And Korematsu is really a case study of what happens when systemic racism normalizes a culture of prejudi prejudice, such as such the demonization falsehoods and injustice seem perfectly just, logical, reasonable, normal. Um, when that happens, you know, history does tell us that the country can descend into a very dark place where neither the facts nor the constitution matters. So what was the crime of Japanese Americans? Well, they, they happened to look like the enemy. Uh, General John DeWitt concluded that their race made them inherently disloyal, stating, quote, the Japanese race is an enemy race. They have, they, the very fact that no sabotage has taken place to date is a disturbing and confirming indication that such action will be taken. So how's that for a conspiracy theory? Uh, the very fact that you've never committed a crime is a disturbing and confirming indication that you will commit a crime. Uh, General DeWitt was the QAnon of his day. Um, I, I agree with uh, uh, Professor Vladek about the, uh, uh, the Warren court uh, really kind of turning the corner, but the irony of Earl Warren is that he was running, he was then attorney general of California in 1942, running for governor on the slogan, the Japs must go and absolutely fundamental to the rounding up. And uh, the fact that in 1954, he led a unanimous Supreme court uh, to uh, overturn uh, de jury segregation uh, in Brown versus Board of Education is kind of a remarkably redemptive act. And, and maybe uh, his reflection on his role during the rounding up of Americans uh, had some uh, impact in, in his decision to change. Well, <clears throat> you know, Fred Korematsu was born in Oakland, California 
regarded himself as 100% American and therefore decided to defy the mass incarceration. Fred was arrested and thus began his lonely battle to reach the Supreme Court, arguing that the mass roundup was unconstitutional. The government defended against his appeal by claiming that Japanese Americans were committing acts of espionage and sabotage in the form of uh, radio signaling from shore to ship. Because not a single Japanese American, however, was ever charged with the espionage, um, let alone tried and convicted, the burden fell on General Witt, DeWitt to issue a final report to prove that what he did was reasonable. There was only one problem with that. It was entirely made up and the government knew it at the time. In 1944, Solicitor General Charles Fay exhorted the Korematsu court not to second guess the judgment of the military, that locking up these Americans was really necessary for the nation's safety. Instead of asking questions, the court deferred, thereby abdicating its constitutional role as a check and balance on the executive branch. In a 63 decision, Justice Black wrote that this was not a case of, of racial hostility. Instead, this was a case of military necessity. How did the court know that the roundup was necessary? The court essentially reasoned because the military says so. 37 years later, Professor Peter Irons found Department of Justice records that had been misfiled by accident in the Commerce Department and forgotten. With researcher Aiko Yoshinaga Herzig, they uncovered whistleblower memos written by Edward Ennis who was then the head of the Enemy Alien Control Division of the Department of Justice and responsible for supervising the drafting of the government's brief defending the mass incarceration. When Ennis began searching for their evidence that Japanese Americans were committing espionage, to his alarm, he found the opposite, that there was no evidence. The Office of Naval Intelligence, a lead agency for the West Coast for national security, had concluded that Japanese Americans posed no threat and had recommended against the mass roundup. Ennis writes to the Solicitor General Charles Fahey, quote, I think we should consider very carefully whether we have a duty to advise the court of the Navy's report. Any other course of conduct might approximate the suppression of evidence, unquote. The Federal Communications Commission found that DeWitt's men were picking up radio signals emanating from, from Tokyo and mischaracterizing them as shore to ship transmissions. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover confirmed, quote, every complaint has been thoroughly investigated and in no case has there been any evidence of illicit signaling. Department of Justice lawyer John Burling wrote to Assist Assistant Attorney General Herbert Wexler, quote, there is no doubt that DeWitt's statements are intentional falsehoods, unquote. Ennis himself wrote to Wexler, quote, we have an ethical duty to refrain from citing DeWitt's claims if the Department of Justice knows that they are untrue. The tenor of the final report is that overt acts of treason were being committed. Since this is not so, it is highly unfair to this racial minority that these lies go uncorrected." Unquote. Over the protests of Ennis and Burling, the evidence was suppressed. The Solicitor General stood behind the final report even though every intelligence agency had categorically debunked its claims. On this basis that a fraud in the high court had been committed, our team of pro bono lawyers were able to have Fred Korematsu's criminal conviction thrown out. The reopening of Fred's case demonstrated that what began as perhaps racist wartime hysteria culminated at the, at the highest levels of our legal system in fraud and misconduct in order to manipulate the outcome of a landmark case. While we won in the lower courts, the government appealed and in a very strategic maneuver, withdrew their appeal. So while Fred's con criminal conviction was thrown out and the Korematsu precedent was found to rest on a foundation of intentional falsehoods, we got no higher in the system. Yeah. I I wanted to pick up on, on a couple of things that you said with Justice Warren and how he actually ran on a platform of anti-Japanese sentiment and then had this redemptive act. And that, that kind of goes to what I mentioned before where 
the Supreme Court itself has overturned itself twice. Um, they reversed Fred Korematsu's criminal conviction and then they overturned the underlying, well, they, they reversed Korematsu and kind of abrogated it. And so, you know, a case could be made that you have won, like you as Fred Korematsu's attorney has com have completely reversed that opinion. Um, it, is that is that true? Did it undo the damage to the rule of law that was done in the 1940s? And, or is Trump versus Hawaii incomplete? Is there still more work to do? Well, um, did Trump v. Hawaii, the, the travel ban, the Muslim case overturned Korematsu, um, the 1944 case? Was it overturned in 2018? I don't think so. <laughs> Chief Justice John Roberts did declare, quote, Korematsu was gravely wrong the day it was decided and has been overruled in the court of history. And to be clear, has no place under the under law or the constitution, unquote. But in the same breath, Roberts dismissively conclude, concluded that Korematsu has nothing to do with the travel ban. Worse, despite Trump's overtly anti-Muslim statements, Roberts accepted the government's word for it, that targeting travelers from Muslim majority countries was necessary for the nation's safety without requiring the government to disclose the official report claimed to be the factual basis for the ban. Sotomayor described the court's blind deference to the president as an affront to the judiciary's role as the independent third branch in our checks and balances democracy, urging, quote, our constitution demands and our country deserves a judiciary willing to hold the coordinate branches to account when they violate our most sacred commitments, unquote. The parallels between formats and the travel ban are very disturbing. Both arose out of war, both featured the government invoking national security in order to shield its actions from judicial scrutiny. Both had abundant evidence of prejudice expressed by high officials against a targeted minority. Both involved hidden intelligence reports that the government refused to disclose. And both ended with the court failing to question whether such sweeping deprivations of fundamental freedoms were necessary to the nation's safety or were instead merely the fulfillment of racist po policies and bigoted campaign promises. I would like to believe the court overturned Korematsu, but I fear that it instead imported its most dangerous feature into a new vessel, so to speak, Trump versus Hawaii, reinforcing the Korematsu precedent that when the government invokes national security, the court will stand down, it will look the other way and won't ask any questions. The lesson of Korematsu is that when our three branches of government fail to be a check and balance on the abuses of the other, it invites alternative facts to hold sway over the real ones. In Korematsu, the result was a civil liberties disaster. Worse, failure of our checks and balances system imperils democracy itself. The fact that 147 members of the House and the Senate voted to overturn the election result after the attack on the Capitol should really give all of us pause to consider the importance of our checks and balances system. And that, on that note, I think that we are about to hear from Representative Allred, who was a firsthand ex uh, witness to what happened in uh, on January 6th. So with that, Don, thank you so much for your comments. We'll, we'll hear from Representative Allred now. Hey everybody, my name is Congressman Colin Allred. I'm incredibly proud to represent Texas's 32nd Congressional District. But before I came to Congress, I was a civil rights attorney. So I am particularly happy to be with y'all this evening, uh, at least virtually. And I'm so glad that you're discussing this. The health of our democracy, uh, the, the uh, title of the event, A Republic If You Can Keep It, I think says everything about uh, what's going on in our country right now and the role that lawyers have to play in this. And so I'll, I'll just say that, you know, like all of you, January 6th for me is a day uh, that I'll never forget. Uh, I was on the House floor uh, as a member of the, the Democratic leadership team. 
Uh, we have limited numbers of folks who can be on the floor now because of COVID, COVID protocols, but I was there. Uh, and when I went to work that morning, I remember uh, uh, knowing that it was going to be a tough day uh, because the president was calling his supporters to be there. He was asking the vice president to overthrow the election. I knew it was probably going to be a long day. We thought that six states were going to be challenged, uh, and two hours of debate each time but certainly never thought it would be a day of violence uh, like what we saw. Uh, and, you know, I, I was on the House floor when uh, the uh, Capitol was breached, uh, was told to you know, put on a, a gas mask that's under our seats, didn't even know we had gas masks under our seats until that day, um, had to evacuate, had to send my wife a text who was at home with our two-year-old and is also pregnant, uh, saying, you know, whatever happens, I love you. Uh, but I really think the most important thing that happened on the 6th wasn't the, the domestic terrorists who attacked the Capitol, killed police officers, wounded uh, you know, 140 uh, police officers, uh, and, and really defaced uh, this kind of you know, temple of our democracy. That wasn't the most important thing. The most important thing is number one, that the Capitol Police, the Metropolitan Police stopped them uh, from being successful in what they wanted to do, which was you know, capture or kill members of Congress and the Vice President. But the most important thing also was that we came back that night, I think to 4 a.m. that night, and we certified those election results. They were not successful. Our democracy did hold. And I'll tell you, you know, even leading up to January 6th, uh, one of the other areas of our democracy that held uh, was the court system. We had dozens of meritless cases brought by attorneys uh, on the Trump side, uh, and even my own uh, state attorney general here in Texas challenging the results in other elections, uh, in other states' elections. And to me, you know, number one, what does the state of Texas know anything about what happened uh, in Pennsylvania's election other than that you didn't like the result? And why is the state of Texas involved in that? Number two, why are all these attorneys bringing these meritless lawsuits, having them thrown out uh, almost immediately in every single case, having no grounding in fact, but then also knowing that some of the claims they were making in the media, they could not make in court uh, because you know, we're bound to certain standards in court. And so I, I actually was proud that our court system held that even with the Supreme Court uh, in the balance that it is now, that it was not at all interested in trying to be involved in overthrowing an election. And so I think that lawyers, unfortunately, played a very negative role in leading up to the sixth and giving it sort of the patina of you know, an official support as if these court cases actually had a chance to be successful. And what they're really trying to do is overturn election results just because they didn't like how the election results came out. And that's not how we do things in our country. And so now the question for all of us as, as attorneys, as folks who care about our country, is what do we do from here? And I believe that every single attorney needs to be invested in protecting our democracy. We are the folks who uh, in law school, get the grounding and having to take con law, uh, understand the constitutional precepts that underlie all of our uh, you know, laws that have, and court cases and rulings that have come out of that, uh, and understand that just how critical it is that, yes, uh, we're a nation of ideals, but that we're a nation of laws as well. And those laws must be upheld and that we have to protect our democracy itself. And so, you know, I was a voting rights attorney, uh, and I hope that every single attorney uh, would consider contributing their, their abilities and their talents uh, to helping your fellow Americans vote. But even if you don't do that, I certainly hope that we will all agree that even if we don't agree on the policy outcomes of a given issue, that we'll at least agree on the fundamental importance of our democracy and how we get to those policy outcomes. And so that's what I hope that we can all do as attorneys to protect our system, to protect our constitution, to protect our republic, because we did have a near-death experience uh, on January 6th, and we had a president of the United States who tried to undermine the democracy that he's supposed to lead. And we as attorneys, we are part of the front line of defense, whether you are in government, whether you are practicing in pro bono or as a civil rights attorney, you are part of that frontline defense because you have the training, the skills, the knowledge to know what's at stake and to understand just how critical it is that we continue to be that beacon uh, for the rest of the world uh, with our democracy and with the rule of law in this country. So I hope uh, that we will never have an event like January 6th ever again. But I know this, uh, for us to recover from this, it's going to re require folks of goodwill who have the ability to use that talent, use their voices, 
to repair our nation. And I know many of the folks on this uh, chat are part of the solution. And I hope that you'll spend your time, efforts, and, and talent uh, in doing that. So thanks so much. And hopefully next time we get to meet and speak, it'll be in person after we get past this pandemic. Thank you all. Hi, good evening, Professor Strassen. Thank you so much for joining us. And I, I really cannot wait to, to hear from you because I have been scratching my head about what, what our other panelists have been talking about and what Congressman Arred just said, which is um, a lot of commentators, legal and political, have, have really attributed what happened on January 6th to um, you know, uncontrolled, unfettered uh, free speech by individuals or the media. Uh, and so you know, as I don't need to, tell you, you're the leading First Amendment scholar, those are some of the most revered and sacred American civil liberties is the freedom of press and the freedom of, freedom of speech. Um, and that's just, that's a real juxtaposition to what we've heard, um, we've heard about so far, which is just, you know, a disrespect for civil liberties for certain people, like when I, from excluding Blacks from institutions of education or interning Japanese Americans. So do we now have this kind of contradiction and tension between um, what are most, some of our most sacred freedoms in uh, speech and media and the protection of our democracy? Uh, and, and if there is a tension, like how do we reconcile that? Well, thank you so much for that excellent question, Heaven. And by the way, I hope we can be on a first name basis. Please call me Nadine, not Professor. Um, but yes, you ask, you make an excellent point. Free speech can indeed cause great harm as well as great good, right? So it is our responsibility as engaged citizens, especially as members of the legal profession, as Congressman Allred stressed, it's our responsibility to vigorously exercise our precious, powerful freedom of speech to support liberty, equality, justice, and democracy, and to oppose those who subvert them. And that's the key theme that I really appreciated throughout the whole film, The Soul of America. Over and over and over again, the film shows the power of speech to propel positive change, helping to bring our nation closer to our founding ideals of liberty and justice for all, which of course uh, we were and still are uh, far away from in reality. But every step that we have made to come closer to those ideals, every step has resulted from exercising First Amendment rights, speaking, advocating, protesting, petitioning. And the influential speech has come not only from the inspiring leaders that the film salutes from Abraham Lincoln to Alice Paul to Martin Luther King, but also from ordinary little nobodies. And those who recall the civil rights clip will, will recognize that I'm quoting that memorable phrase uh, from Janice Wesley Kelsey. Uh, she used it in the film and the clip that we showed. She's an African-American woman who became active in the civil rights movement when she was only 15 years old. And she rightly stressed that this movement would not have succeeded without the voices of countless people who are relatively unknown. But what about the dangerous speech that you brought up um, in your excellent question, Heaven? Uh, key examples, including this speech that we heard on January 6th and speech that led up to January 6th. Well, our legal system does rightly empower government to bar and punish speech when the speech directly causes or threatens to cause certain specific imminent serious harms, including intentional incitement of imminent violence or lawlessness that is likely to happen imminently, and also including speech that is part of a conspiracy to undermine democracy or civil rights. Prosecutors we hear are now examining potential incitement charges against Donald Trump and others. Uh, moreover, relying on the conspiracy theory, Congressman Benny Thompson and the NAACP have sued Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, 
and a couple militant organizations. Uh, likewise, a group called Integrity First for America has brought a conspiracy lawsuit against organizers of the deadly 2017 rally in Charlottesville, of which we saw um, some uh, terrifying clips. The judge in that case already rejected a First Amendment defense based on detailed allegations about concrete steps the defendants took to plan and to carry out their violent actions. And I think that ruling was correct as a matter of First Amendment law. Now, in contrast, our legal system rightly does not let government punish speech when the speech does not directly pose an emergency. Even when its ideas are hateful, even when its ideas are hated, and even when the speech raises fears that it might indirectly lead to some future harm. Yes, this is a serious danger, but history has taught us that it's even more dangerous for government to wield censorship power under a looser non-emergency standard. For most of our history, government did have power to punish any speech that had a so-called bad tendency. And that broad, vague standard gave officials too much discretion. So they could and did selectively punish controversial ideas and unpopular and disempowered speakers. Predictably, most censorship victims were members of marginalized groups, including racial minorities and government critics. Government consistently silenced reform activists, including many who were celebrated in the film, abolitionists, suffragists, anti-war protesters, labor organizers, socialists, and civil rights demonstrators. That is why Martin Luther King wrote his historic, eloquent letter from a Birmingham jail. He was imprisoned for trying to lead a demonstration against American apartheid. I'd like to quote the great Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis in a landmark opinion that championed the free speech rights of activist Anita Whitney. He said, Fear of serious injury cannot alone justify suppressing free speech. Men feared witches and burned women. So those of us who support the values that were attacked on January 6th um, by rioters and, and, and their instigators, uh, the values of liberty, equality, justice, and democracy, all of us who defend these values have the biggest stake in supporting free speech and opposing censorship. We have to make sure that any punishment of speech that does occur adheres to the appropriately strict First Amendment standards uh, so that it cannot become a precedent that will stifle our voices. Thank, thank you so much for that. And, and, you know, as the anchor of our panel, I think you have the tall task of bringing us from the, the re very real and very uh, grim uh, discussion about white supremacy and racial injustice and bringing it to a little bit of hopefulness and trying to give us, especially the lawyers on the line, uh, some, some next steps of what we can do to make all of this better. And, you know, I think your scholarship and you just now drew a lot of distinctions that are very, like, amazingly helpful for lawyers to try to educate each other and educate other professionals. But we, I think a lot of us would appreciate just some tools and just basic skills, the most simple distillation of the First Amendment, so that we can take that forward and kind of talk to other people, uh, especially because First Amendment is something that's kind of thrown out there all the time and, and people don't necessarily understand it applies to the government and all of all of the nuances that you just described. How, how can you help us, uh, or please do help us arm ourselves with uh, tools to talk to the public and drown out the hate speech with the good speech? You, you've made such important points, Heaven. Uh, all of us who want to summon our better angels have a civic duty and a moral duty to raise our voices constantly and 
proactively. Uh, and evidence shows that doing so has a much more positive impact than most people realize. Everything from supporting and empowering people who are targets of hate speech uh, to educating and inoculating people against disinformation and misinformation to redeeming even confirmed leaders of hate monger organizations. Uh, we have many moving examples of such individuals who have been reached out to by others in a compassionate and empathetic way, not at all compassionate toward their ideas, but toward them as people, helping them to redeem themselves. And we now have whole cadres of people, even who were leaders of hate monger organizations who are dedicating their lives to preventing others from going down that path and to recruiting those who have already gone down it, working with organizations such as Life After Hate. Uh, conversely, if we do not raise our voices to support our better angels, we thereby enable and encourage the demons that have also plagued us throughout our history, as the film shows. Uh, the film quotes famed journalist Edward R. Murrow, who courageously and influentially raised his voice against Senator Joseph McCarthy and his anti-communist witch hunts. And Murrow, Murrow urged others to do likewise. He said, this is no time for those who oppose Senator McCarthy's message to keep silent. And I want to guarantee to every member of this audience, you will make a difference on all of the important issues that we've been discussing, no matter what, either through your speech or through your silence. The courageous German pastor and Nazi resistor Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it this way, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. And Martin Luther King put it this way. He said, in the long run, we will recall even more than the words of our enemies, the silence of our friends. So I'd like to conclude by saying to all of our friends in the audience out there, thank you uh, for exercising your most precious, most powerful right, the right not to remain silent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadine. And that is an excellent reminder for all of us. I think it, I think it inspires all of us to just think back of why we went to law school. So that was an incredible send off. And with that, we will go to one last uh, clip from Mr. Meacham and then pass it back to Manuel. Thank you. The work of citizenship at this particular moment, if you believe that we need a change in the presidency of the United States, the work becomes convincing the right number of people in the right number of states that you're right and they need to agree with you. And so the work of citizenship now is in fact the work of democracy in its purest sense. I think our role as citizens is to become civically engaged if the Japanese Americans have anything to say to the public about this is don't take your liberties for granted. They can be taken away from you. We are going to build a wall! What's at stake in this political and cultural moment is the nature of the Democratic Republic. Nazis out! Immigrants in! Our reality is farther away from the American ideal today than it was three or four years ago. People think the other side is evil and must be stopped. The internment that we went through is history now, 75 years old. But I feel like it is current news. These facilities have now been repurposed as detention centers for families. What's happening on our southern borders is the same kind of irrationality. She was warned. She was given an explanation. Nevertheless, she persisted. 
One of the things that the women's movement fought for in that early incarnation was the idea that women should just be able to stand up and speak of politics. We cannot, we will not be silenced. And that's something we're still fighting for today. What I see going on today is so reminiscent of what I saw in the 60s. There's so many forces today that are preaching hate and division. We need leadership now to lift us, to inspire us, to be guided by better angels. We've always grown stronger the more widely we've opened our arms, the more generously we've interpreted what Thomas Jefferson meant when he said that all men were created equal. If we don't make that case, if we don't tell that story, then we're gonna be perpetually in two armed camps staring at each other and neither side wants to blink. The question at this moment is, will we continue to pursue a more perfect union or will we settle into a constant state of tribal warfare in a ferocious struggle with our worst instincts? How do we get to 51%? How do we do the right thing just enough of the time? Dark forces are perennial. The good news is that the forces of light can also be perennial. And let's just see how we can get that side to win a little bit more often. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Manuel Quinto Pozos. I'm the past chair of the Austin Lawyer Chapter of ACS. I want to remind everyone of the course number for claiming CLE credit in Texas. The number is 174-113-888. That's 174-113-888. The number is also shown at the end of my screen name. Instructions on how to receive CLE credit in California were previously emailed to all participants. We apologize that due to time constraints and an already full program, we were unable to include a full question and answer period. Thinking back to the film images we have seen and to our speakers' presentations, remember the role that the law and that lawyers played in disenfranchisement dehumanization and acts of violence in our country's history. Slavery and disenfranchisement were enshrined in our constitution. Jim Crow and segregation were codified in the law. Japanese American incarceration in the 1940s and child separation in the recent past were accomplished by executive order. And it took lawyers and in some cases courts to defend and uphold these practices. And it was lawyers who advanced claims of voter fraud in the 2020 election, and some lawyers as US representatives and US senators tried to overturn the election. And at least one prominent lawyer incited mobs leading to an insurrection. Where do we go from here? Franklin said, we have a republic if we can keep it. As the last clip argues, it is left to us to preserve our democracy, to fight for true equality, regardless of race and identity, to expand instead of contracting the right to vote, to ensure immigrants are not separated or incarcerated. And as lawyers, it is our professional responsibility, at the very least, to refuse to promote false facts and narratives in the work that we do. So become a member and increase your involvement in your local legal and non-legal communities. Seek out and help build and promote the activities of your local chapter of ACS and those of our sponsoring and supporting organizations. 
Thank you to all our speakers, sponsors, and supporters, and thanks to all of you. This concludes our program for this evening.